Hey, this is Barbara, and this is our review for test five. We went over, once again, subordinate clauses and verbal phrases. Traditional grammar draws an important distinction between clauses and phrases. Okay, so remember that we're saying that a clause is a group of words with a subject and a verb. I know that seems very obvious, but, but don't forget that we need a subject and we need a verb. Remember, too, that a subordinate clause has to have some kind of subordinating word. So, uh, who, we also saw that as a subordinator for all three kinds of subordinate clauses. When, right? Verbal phrases are groups of words that have a verbal, but that do not contain a real verb. So they have a verbal, but not a real verb. And remember that we said a verbal is a word that's made out of a verb, but that functions as some other part of speech. It doesn't function like a real verb. Remember, too, that verbal phrases do not have a subordinating word, like a that, or a who, or a which, or a when. Okay, so remember, clauses have to have a subject and a verb. Verbal phrases do not have a verb. They might have a subject, but they won't have a verb, and they don't use a subordinating word. Of course, always be aware that there might be some crazy exception to anything I say on this, but in general, okay? I know I'm beating this to death, but okay. A clause always needs a subject and a verb to be a clause in traditional grammar. Remember that a subordinate clause also needs some kind of subordinating word, even though that word might be unexpressed or phantom. Thank you, Michael. Right? We saw that happen a lot with, with that, right? But you should be able to imagine it there and see that it does indeed make sense. Remember that a verbal phrase does not have a subordinating word. And remember that a verbal phrase doesn't have a real verb. In linguistics, they'd call it a finite verb, which really just means like the main verb of a clause, the verb that could actually be the main verb of a sentence. So a verbal phrase is formed out of a verb, but it doesn't function as a verb. It functions as some other part of speech. And remember this, too. To complicate things, of course, some verbal phrases have their own subjects. Now, remember that gerund phrases do not have their own subjects. Participial phrases do not have subjects. Participial phrases very often follow a noun, but that's the noun that they're modifying. It's not a noun that's functioning as their subject. Remember that participial phrases always function as adjectives, so they're going to be modifying some noun, but that noun is not their subject. So don't include the noun that's, that the participial phrase is modifying when you're putting brackets around the participial phrase. Absolute phrases have subjects, and that's part of their structure, that they have a participle with a noun in front of it, a participle with a subject. So if you look at this example sentence, his hair blowing in the wind, Rick skated down the boulevard. Here's our absolute phrase, his hair blowing in the wind. Here's our participle, blowing. That's a present participle with the ing. And do you see the noun in front of it? It's subject, hair. The hair is the stuff that's blowing in the wind. It might seem that like this is trying to modify Rick, but that's not really what's going on because you want to look at how the verbal itself is functioning. And Rick was not blowing anywhere. It was his hair that was blowing. So hair is the subject of the participle blowing inside that absolute phrase. Infinitive phrases, too, sometimes have subjects. Not always, but sometimes. And when they do, you want to make sure that when you're bracketing the infinitive phrase, you include that subject inside the infinitive phrase. Because that subject doesn't really make sense anywhere else in the sentence. It only makes sense inside the infinitive phrase. So look at this example. We heard them eat the ribs. I'm distracted now, but okay. Here's our infinitive phrase, them eat the ribs. Here's the actual infinitive, the base form of the verb, eat, with the subject them. All right, them eat the ribs. They're the ones who are eating the ribs. And do you see that if we didn't include them, inside the infinitive phrase, it wouldn't make any sense outside with we heard. It wouldn't make sense to say like we heard them this. So if we include the them as the subject inside that infinitive phrase, 
then we can see that an entire infinitive phrase is actually functioning as the direct object of heard. We heard this. Okay, take a look at these two sentences and see if you can see what's different about them. They mean the same, but there's something different. It's a structural issue. It's not a, a, a meaning issue. Okay, so look at number one and number two. The people waiting for the movie ate dinner in their car, as opposed to the people who were waiting for the movie ate dinner in their car. Hey, Mom. Yes, you. Why fuss and fret about dinner? Why not have it right here? Yes, this drive-in offers everyone in the family a real picnic treat for dinner. So why fuss? Give your family a tasty dinner at this drive-in. You see, you could eat your entire dinner at the drive-in. <laughs> I wish we still had drive-ins everywhere. That was fun. I guess it was fun. I don't know. You'd, you'd get really eaten by mosquitoes, and it was sometimes cold. And You know, if you were a kid, you had, as you can see here, you had to sit in the back seat, and you couldn't really see over your gigantic parents and their heads. Okay. Okay, so they're eating dinner in their car, waiting for the movie to begin. Okay, but look at these two sentences. What do you see that's different? Do you see in number one we have waiting for the movie? You know what, I'm going to do it like this because I think that's easier to see. Waiting for the movie. And then in number two we have who were waiting for the movie. And in each case, in number one and number two, you can see that the independent clause is really the people ate dinner in their car. That's true for both number one and number two. So what's different about the subordinating structures waiting for the movie and who were waiting for the movie? Do you see that in number two, we actually have a subject and a verb? Who were waiting? I should change this color so it's going to be clearer to see. Who were waiting. So we have a subject and a verb. In the subordinate unit in number one, we don't have a subject and a verb. We have the verbal waiting, but it's not a complete verb and we don't have a subject for it. We also don't have a subordinating word for it in number one, as we do here in number two. Who is a subordinating word that we recognize. So in number two we have a subject and a verb and a subordinating word, whereas in number one we don't have a complete verb we don't have a subject for it, and we also don't have a subordinating word. So, number one, what we have is a participial phrase modifying people. It's a present participle. You see our ing? All right, and number two, what we have is an adjective clause. We have a full clause because we have a subject and a real verb, and we have a subordinating word. It is also modifying people, just as the participial phrase in number one was modifying people, because they both function as adjectives, but one's a clause, one's a phrase. Okay, let's look at some more practice sentences. We're going to get away from this particular issue of the difference between a participial phrase and an adjective clause. These are going to be some sentences that are going to give you all sorts of subordination in them. You ready? Okay. Okay, look at number one. When the store opened at 4 a.m., the shoppers rushed in to take advantage of the sales. Yeah, I know. Look at this. Yeah. So what do you see in number one? Well, you probably recognize that when the store opened at 4 a.m. is something. And you also probably see that to take advantage of the sales is something. So what do you think? When the store opened at 4 a.m.? Well, you probably see that we have a subject and a verb, right? Store opened. We also have a subordinating word, when. And that could subordinate for actually all three kinds of, of clauses, of all kinds of subordinate clauses. But this really sounds like an adverb clause to me of time, right? Couldn't be a noun. It's not really an adjective because it's not modifying a noun. So it needs to be an adverb of time. But what do you make of to take advantage of the sales? Notice that we do not have a subordinating word. We also don't have a subject and a complete verb. This is an infinitive phrase, and it's kind of an easy, to, easy one to recognize because we have the to take with a to in front of it. This is one of those infinitive phrases that's really functioning as an adverb because it's kind of like in order to. You know, they rushed in in order to take advantage of the sales. Okay, look at number two. With all the shopping carts taken, the shoppers had no choice but to carry all their items in their arms. There are a couple of different structures here. 
do you see with all the shopping carts taken? What do you want to say that is? Well, notice that we have something here. Is that a real verb or is it a verbal? We have a noun in front of it that's kind of acting as its subject. So do we want to say this is a clause or do we want to say it's a phrase? Notice that we do not have any kind of subordinating word at the beginning here. With is not a subordinating word. Notice also that we don't have a main verb. Taken is a past participle, but it can't actually function as the main verb of a clause. You couldn't just say the sandwich taken from the store, period. Right? That wouldn't work. That's not a main verb. So we have a participle with a noun in front of it, carts, right? This is an absolute phrase. Do you see the structure that tells you that it's an absolute phrase? Okay. So let's look at the rest of the sentence. The shoppers had no choice but to carry all their items in their arms. Do you see to carry all their items in their arms as an infinitive phrase? There's our infinitive right there, to carry. Is that infinitive transitive or intransitive? It's a transitive infinitive. Items is the direct object. That's the thing that we're actually carrying, right? To carry their items. All right? That one's functioning as a object of the preposition, but it's but in the sense of except, you know, it's that kind of but, not the conjunction but. Okay, look at these. Black Friday, which seems to begin earlier each year, is an American custom that marks the beginning of the Christmas holiday shopping season. Well, we have which seems to begin earlier each year. Everybody probably recognizes which as a subordinating word, right? It's also functioning as the subject here of seems, which seems, which is a relative pronoun here. This is an adjective clause modifying Black Friday, okay, with the subject which, the verb seems. Also inside that adjective clause, we have this infinitive phrase, to begin earlier each year. Do you recognize that as an infinitive phrase, really functioning as subjective complement coming after the linking verb seems, but it's inside that adjective clause. Okay, let's go on. Is an American custom that marks the beginning of the Christmas holiday shopping season? Okay, do you see another adjective clause here that marks the beginning of the Christmas holiday shopping season? That's modifying custom. That one is restrictive, whereas the first one, which seems to begin earlier each year, is non-restrictive. We had a pair of commas around it because we were talking about a very specific day, this Black Friday thing. All right, look at number four. I suppose stampeding through a target at 4 a.m. might be fun if you were in the right mood. This one's tricky. Well, you're probably recognizing stampeding through a target at 4 a.m. As, as something, right? possibly gerund? Well, to figure out what's going on with stampeding through a target at 4 a.m., we have to pull the camera back a little bit and look for a larger structure that it's inside. And that is a noun clause that goes like that. All right, and that whole noun clause is the direct object of suppose. It's what I suppose. Now, Inside that noun clause, the subject of that noun clause is the gerund phrase stampeding through a target at 4 a.m. That whole gerund phrase is the subject of the noun clause, and it's the subject of the verb might be inside that noun clause. I suppose this might be fun if you're in the right mood. Notice we have something else going on here, too. We have, if you're in the right mood, do you recognize that as an adverb clause of condition? If, of course, is our subordinating word. You is the subject. R is the verb. Does that all make sense? Okay, let's look at some problems, some of the problems we talked about. Okay, we talked about fragments that we categorized as subordinate clauses standing by themselves, verbal phrases standing by themselves, or a noun followed by a phrase or a clause, but without a main verb for that noun. That's a common kind of sentence fragment. We also talked about dangling modifiers, 
participials, gerunds, or infinitive phrases. Remember we said that verbal modifiers, verbal phrase modifiers, are going to attach themselves to the first noun that comes along. And in the case of a dangling modifier, they are attaching themselves to a noun that could not possibly be performing the action of the verbal. So you can get something absurd or hilarious or strange or something. So that's a dangling modifier. We also talked about faulty parallel structure, which means that a sentence is trying to express coordinating ideas in different grammatical structures. Okay, let's look at some examples of fragments. Flying through the halls. That's one of those that's just a verbal phrase by itself, right? And we can't really say if it's a gerund or if it's a participle because it's, it's out of the context of a complete sentence. But it doesn't work like this just by itself. Okay, here's, here's an example of the noun followed by a phrase. So we have bat flying through the halls. We have a noun, but flying is not a complete verb. So we can't say that the bat is flying because it's not a fully conjugated verb. It's just a participle like this. Do we have some sound effects of a bat? bat sound effects? No, bats don't sound like that. No. No, bats make like little clicking, squeaking, cute noises. Yeah, that. See, that's a bat sound. That. Okay. Do we have, do we have uh, some footage of a bat? Like a, a cute little bat face? Because they're really cute. That's upsetting. I'm gonna have nightmares now. Okay, let's let's forget about the bat for a while. Let's go on to although I was very tired. Okay. Although I was very tired is one of those that's just a subordinate clause. That's an adverb clause, right? It's a very common adverb clause, but it can't stand by itself. Even though it does have a subject and it does have a complete verb, I was, still the although makes it subordinate. And this one down here, the movie that Tim told me about is actually very much like the bat flying through the halls over here in that we have a noun followed by, in this case, an adjective clause that's modifying that noun. But we don't have a verb for movie. Just as here in number two, we don't have a verb for bat, except the verb should probably be something like terrified Barbara with its long teeth. Anyway, in the last sentence, we, we don't have a verb for for a movie. We don't have a predicate for a movie. The movie needs to do something, okay? So those are some common sentence fragments. Let's look at some dangling modifiers. Again, as we were saying, different verbal phrases can end up creating dangling modifiers if they are right in front of a noun that could not possibly be doing what the verbal phrase is implying. So look at number one. Brushing my teeth this morning, the phone rang. Okay, what would you say here is the dangling modifier. Okay, it's pretty obviously the brushing my teeth this morning, right? What kind is it? It's a participle. It's a participial phrase. And what's wrong with it? Well, the phone, of course, did not brush my teeth. Yes, I know. Okay. So the phone could not possibly brush my teeth. All right, number two. After watching six back-to-back -back episodes of The Office, my bag of hers, buffalo blue cheese curls, and my glass were both mysteriously empty. Yeah. Okay. All right. What's our what's our dangling modifier here? Do you see that it's after watching six back-to-back -back episodes of The Office? What kind is it? Do you see that it's a gerund phrase right here? Watching the blah 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 to office gerund functioning is the object of the preposition after. Okay, it's one of those. And here again too, you can see that my bag and my glass my uh, bag of cheese curls and my glass were not actually watching the office, not themselves. They were around, but they weren't actually watching it with their eyes. Yes. All right, number three. Before moving to Los Angeles, the Pacific Ocean was something he had seen only in pictures. Ah, the Pacific Ocean. That's gorgeous. All right, anyway, do you see that this one here, too, before moving to Los Angeles? Back to St. Louis now, okay. Before moving to Los Angeles, this also is a gerund here, moving to Los Angeles, functioning as the object of the preposition before. 
before this. And of course, the problem here is that the Pacific Ocean did not move to Los Angeles, right? Well, it's an interesting visual. And think of the Pacific Ocean driving across the country or something to Los Angeles. But no, can't happen. All right. Four, while driving to school this morning, my coffee spilled all over my clothes, my car, and my papers. I love Adam Carolla. <laughs> All right, do you see that this is our dangling verbal phrase modifier while driving to school this morning? That's one of those elliptical time clauses. It's one of those that has the when or the while, right? And of course, again, the problem is that the coffee wasn't actually the thing that was driving, right? I've done this many times, dump coffee all over the place. I need one of these things. Introducing the Spill Defender. The Spill Defender easily rests on the driver's lap, providing the ultimate in protection from harmful spills or food stains. It's perfect for your commute. The patented Spill Defender is a disposable adult bib made from the highest quality materials, consisting of a top absorbent layer with a durable plastic barrier underneath. Yeah, I, I, do you think that's real? I don't know. I love the part where that bib thing has has a hole in it that fits exactly over the gear shift now. <laughs> yeah, that might be a great invention. Okay, let's look at some examples of faulty parallel. Okay, when we're talking about faulty parallel structure, we're talking about coordinating ideas in a sentence that really do need to be expressed as the same grammatical animal. So look at this sentence. Three elements of good writing are thinking logically, organizing ideas coherently, and to explain assertions clearly. Well, you can probably feel without thinking too much about it that thinking, organizing, and to explain don't line up. And you probably wouldn't even phrase it this way, but how can you explain what's wrong with the parallel here? Let's break it down a little bit differently and look at it this way. This is the same sentence, but it's, it's arranged spatially a little bit different. And you can see that three elements of good writing are, is really kind of the stem of the sentence. And that's the part of the sentence that lines up with all three of the elements that it is listing. These are the three things that are the, the elements of good writing. But if you write it like this, you can see a little bit more obviously what's going on structurally with thinking logically, organizing ideas coherently, and to explain assertions clearly. So if you look at it like this, do you see that thinking logically and organizing ideas coherently are both gerund phrases functioning as subjective complements coming after the linking verb are? And do you see that to explain assertions clearly is an infinitive phrase? also functioning as a subjective complement, but it doesn't line up because you have two gerunds and one infinitive. So you have two gerund phrases and one infinitive phrase. Okay, let's look at another one. The Pickwick Papers is long, funny, and has great characters. This is a very early Dickens novel. It might be his first, actually. It's very funny. It's very long. It's very funny. This is all true. Okay. Anyway, The Pickwick Papers is long, funny, and has great characters. This one maybe doesn't sound as obviously wrong as the previous example, but there's still a faulty parallelism going on here. Do you see what it is? Look at the sentence like this. And maybe if you break it down like this, it really jumps out at you more. So the Pickwick Papers is... Do you see that you can easily say the Pickwick Papers is long? You can say the Pickwick Papers is funny. But you can't say the Pickwick Papers is, has great characters. That's immediately wrong. And if you do it that way too, if you break it up like this, you can see pretty clearly that long is an adjective subjective complement. Funny is an adjective subjective complement. Both long and funny are coming after the linking verb is here, right? But what is going on with has great characters? Well, that's a transitive verb here with a direct object. So what this structure is doing is moving from 
a pattern too in the first two examples, right, with a linking verb and an adjective subjective complement to a pattern three structure with a transitive verb and a direct object. That's where the clash is. Let's look at one more. The scene not only shows us Joy Holga's arrogance, but also that she is very naive. This sentence has a couple different problems. One of them involves the not only, but also. And this is one of those correlative conjunctions that we talked about. Remember that correlative conjunctions are the ones that go in pairs, like not only, but also, or either, or, or both, and. So the not only, but also. And a couple of things you want to remember about correlative conjunctions. One is that you want to make sure that the two things that they're paralleling or, or correlating are the same grammatical shape. And you also want to make sure that you're careful about the placement of the first element of the correlative conjunction. You want to put it right in front of the first thing that you're actually paralleling. So one problem with this sentence is that the not only is coming right in front of the verb shows. And that's a problem in this sentence because we're not actually paralleling the verb shows with another transitive verb. If we were, then this would be the right position for not only. But we're not. We're actually trying to parallel the arrogance with her very naive attitude, okay? So the not only really needs to be after shows us because that's where the parallel really begins in the sentence. Okay, so that's point number one. But let's look a little bit more carefully at, at the parallel itself aside from the fact that the not only is positioned wrong. So if you look at it like this, the scene shows us, and these are really the two things that it's showing us, right? Joy Holga's arrogance. Do you know this story, this Flannery O'Connor story, Good Country People? Find it if you haven't read it. It's a terrific story. What's going on with Joy Holga's arrogance and that she is very naive? Structurally, how are those things different? Notice each one of them lines up okay with the scene shows us. We could say the scene shows us Joy Holga's arrogance. We could also say the scene shows us that she is very naive. Separately they work, but we can't put them together in a sentence and get something that works because these two things have very different structures. Do you see that that she is very naive is a noun clause actually functioning as the direct object of shows? The scene shows us this, whereas Joy Holga's arrogance is really just a noun here with an adjective in front of it, an, an adjective that's in the possessive, right? So we're considering that an adjective. So we really just have a noun direct object in this first example, and in the second, we have a full noun clause. So that could be revised a couple of ways. We could say the scene shows us Joy Holga's arrogance and her naivete and really make it compound direct object that way. Or we could, we could actually make some combined uh, noun clause thing too. We could say the scene shows us that Joy Holga is arrogant and naive. So either one works. It's not like one is right or wrong. It would depend on the context of your sentence, but okay. Well, we looked at subordination some more, and we looked at sentence fragments and dangling modifiers and faulty parallels. That's it. That's our review for test five. Dun, dun, dun.